Hello folks, uh, this is a little channel update, this is my brand new camera, it is a Vantrue N2 Pro. I paid about $170 for it from Amazon, and I got the link from another channel, uh, from the Uberman channel, which I will link below to his video about this camera, and if you want to get one, get one from him, because he's a good guy and uh, I watch his stuff a lot. But anyway, uh, this is my new camera. My original plan was just to buy another Roadhog camera after my last one kind of died. Watch my previous videos about that whole thing. And that was my original plan, but I did some research and I decided, you know what? I'm going to try something different. And the biggest reason why I bought this camera is because of the, the rear-facing camera that's right over here on to the right. It has infrared vision on it, which is good because... Uh, I still do a lot of Uber driving, even though I rag on the company a whole lot. I just still do it at night because, well, I still can make money at it, even though Uber makes it very difficult to be able to do so, but I still do it. And most of the driving I do is at night, and so it works better than just having my you know, front-facing camera. At least I can see inside the cabin and see if things go on in there. And that's basically the reason why I went toward this one. And of course, the one night that I tested it out, um, it worked really good. Of course, uh, I am going to have um, you know some sample footage at the end of this video of what I recorded today. Unfortunately, my dumbass forgot to save some of the footage that I recorded at night, and uh, so I won't have any of that available. Oops, sorry. Uh, but anyway, uh, this camera. I've only had it for a couple days, so I really can't review it, or in depth at least, but my first impressions is that it is really good. Uh, it comes with the suction cup mount, which of course you plug your uh, USB cable into, and this is long enough to go around the sides, but I never did that with my old camera. I have it plugged in down there. Um, the reason why I don't do that is because, you know, this is not my truck, I can't really do anything too big with the wiring and plus it's rumors that all the trucks are going to be replaced in a few weeks anyway so I'm not going to bother with that and I never did. It has another USB port right here to extract files from and of course it comes with a shorter USB cable that plugs into there so that's nice. If you take off this cover, uh, if I can get it, there it goes. You got an HDMI port, which you can use that to plug into your TV and watch videos that way. And of course, down here is where the uh, SD card goes in. Uh, the cool thing about the USB port is that, unlike with my old camera, I don't have to take this in and out all the time, which is what basically failed in my last camera. That was the start of the downfall. Uh, it records 1080p for both directions. Uh, if you turn off this camera, which for most of the day I did, uh, you can get 1080p and 60 frames facing outward, and also there is like a 1520 or some strange higher resolution that I never heard of before getting this camera that's somewhere in between 1080p and 4K vision, which is cool, I guess. <laughs> um... The one small complaint I have about the front-facing camera is that, at least compared to my old camera, is that my old camera handled night vision a lot better than this one does. But other than that, I mean, as long as it's, like, shown under lights, it looks, it, as long as there's street lights and stuff, they're, you're fine. It's just, you know, it looks a little underexposed for night vision, but other than that, I don't have too many complaints. The only other complaint I have about this camera is this mount is that if you want to release it without re releasing the uh, suction cup, there's the button is up the front, which if you're feeling around for it, it's right underneath the camera lens and you you can have like a very high risk of like you know smudging up the camera if you're reaching around you can't find the button right away. It would just be better if like the the release button and of course I can't even do it right I'm doing this one-handed if like the reason it would be better if like the release button was like right up here you know instead of all the way around like that 
But other than that, that's I do like this camera a lot. Again, it's $170 I got this for from using the link from Uberman, which that link will be below. Um, other than that, um, I have not much to say. Bye. Just... <laughs> I'm telling you, 10 years from now. To vehemently it's 10 years from now, we're going to have driverless cars, so we're not going to have Uber no That's more. That's true. Super no, true. Okay. Very true. But will the Uberless cars be stocked with that Do you think? No. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that could add to motion sickness or sickness in it's, general it's or things that people are allergic to, I they don't want to clean up a mess. They don't want to like clean up messes about now. This more than we did. <laughs> <laughs> He's right there. Like the reality is like you're not gonna you're not gonna introduce something to that's gonna make people more likely the environment. To vomit yeah, yeah, car. exactly. Like you I don't mean, want them to vibe I read a news article that Uber is starting to do like this motion sensing stuff on your phone to detect if you're drunk or not. What? So if you're too drunk you can't request an Uber. That seems but to isn't that the, the reason purpose? why you would request an Uber? I guess maybe if you're a particular kind of Uber driver that doesn't want like to yeah. risk people getting sick in your car. And, I'm, and I'm, my first thought is, well, maybe it's because they have the driverless cars now because they're testing them in some places. But I would fail that test and, every week, man. Like, well, the only time I request an Uber is when like, you're too drunk to drive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's weird. Jeez. I'm just thinking they don't want the puke stains on the brand new driverless yeah. cars that they own. Right. That does make sense. Let's push them on the uh, Uber X yeah. drivers <laughs> that we don't own. That's why I'm telling you. Five, that's why I'm doing five stars and yeah, you know, <laughs> like doing the tips, man. Like, and I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nowadays, that GDP has risen to 11 trillion dollars and accounts for 15 percent of all economic activity in the world. This economic renaissance of the last 40 years is largely thanks to one industry, manufacturing. We've come to accept that China is the world's factory, but it wasn't always this way. In the early 20th century, goods were often just produced right where they were sold. America made American goods, Europe made European goods. It wasn't until cheap worldwide shipping became available that the production side of a company could be relocated to the other side of the world. But why did China win? How did this country become the manufacturing giant it is today? In 1978, Deng Xiaoping took power in the People's Republic of China. He quickly visited Bangkok, Singapore, and other flourishing Asian cities and was convinced that, in order to succeed, China needed to open itself up to the outside world, at least to an extent. He gave people control of their farms, privatized business, and most importantly, allowed foreign investment in the country for the first time in decades. He opened up four special economic zones with tax incentives and exemption from the oversight that the rest of the country saw on its investments and trade activity. These four zones were essentially the free market portions of China. But none was more successful than this one, Shenzhen in the Guangdong province, so I went there to see what it was like. Before its designation as a special economic zone in 1980, Shenzhen was a tiny town with about 30,000 inhabitants. But today, that's grown to nearly 18 million people. That means that its size rivals that of New York and London. It's believed that Shenzhen might have been the single fastest growing city in human history. Every other special economic zone was an established area before its designation. Democratic Republic of China into what he called the Great Leap Forward. Over the course of five years, he intended to transform China from an agrarian society into an industrial powerhouse. One of the many goals Mao set was the eradication of those species he deemed to be unwanted pests. Flies, mosquitoes, and rats all made the hit list for Mao's four pests campaign, as did sparrows since they ate seeds that could otherwise have been used for human consumption. China's entire population was mobilized in Mao's war against the sparrows. And there could only be one winner. Within a few short years, the birds had been all but wiped out with catastrophic results. While sparrows did eat a small amount of seeds, the bulk of their diet was made up of insects. Now, with the sparrows gone,